thank you so much for making the time to be here tonight. So as Leslie said, my name is Mariam Kamara. I'm an architect from Niger, um, where I have a firm called um, Atelier Masumi, based in Niamey, the capital. And um, it's a small firm and um, where we essentially learn to grapple with our immediate context of Niger being this landlocked country surrounded by you know, countries like Algeria, Libya, Mali, Chad, Nigeria, um, and all of the complexities that that entails, but also um, the, all the geographic and climatic challenges that a place that is in the middle of the Sahara Desert um, brings with it. And as such, we practice architecture in a context really um, that constantly makes us question and um, makes us question our instincts, actually, and um, our design decisions, particularly because, as Leslie um, said, I was U.S. trained. So the story of our practice has also been the story of how do we, how do you translate this education acquired elsewhere into this completely different context. And that context has made me really acutely aware that really architecture, um, now as I've come to understand it, is about stories. It's about, you know, a set of narratives, you know, a context, a history, a climate, um, a geography. Um, but it's also in a very intangible and very subtle way um, about the desires and the motivations, really, of the people who commission architecture and who also design architecture. And that has been quite a learning experience for me. And this is why, you know, then we come to understand that architecture um, can help us tell the story of a people, for example. Um, architecture can tell stories of power and ritual and myths, right? Um, or even stories of love, <laughs> um, but also stories of marginalization. You know, through architecture, we can read all of those things in the social fabric of a place. Architecture also tells, um, in my immediate context, stories of global domination and or agency or lack of agency. Um, one thing that always struck me and that I always go back to um, is this particular set of images where on the left-hand side you have um, the Jenny Mosque. And on the right side, um, something else that looks like the Jenny Mosque. Um, because essentially, during colonization, um, the French were trying to find something that was worthy in architecture in West Africa. And they had basically decided that there was nothing worthwhile, really, um, architecture point of view, even though there were long established cities there um, with quite striking architecture actually. And they zeroed in on the Jenny Mosque and on the, um, the Timbuktu Mosque as being kind of like these pillars um, that show what is you know, the one thing that maybe they could use to create an identity for the architecture they wanted to, to build um, for their um, administrative infrastructure. And so on the right hand side um, you have this building in Dakar and Senegal at the top um, which is actually a maternity ward, and at the bottom um, is a train station in Bobo Julasso in Burkina Faso. And so essentially they created this whole aesthetic called Neo-Sudanese architecture, which um, really meant that all the buildings, all the administrative buildings looked like mosques, essentially. Um, and so that domination then, you know, um, in the 20th century has also meant that the architectural discourse and what we learn, and it, frankly, our architectural education also has a very heavy bias at the end of the day. You know, one thing that I had to unlearn um, when I moved back to Niger to start working, for example, is how um, the stories of how people lived their lives shaped Western architecture as it should but then we're kind of copying those things into our context, and it's kind of difficult to translate them. So for example, when you're thinking about um, urban design or public space and what makes a public case space desirable, I love this image because it just seems like the kind of place I would want to be. But it's the kind of place that you can absolutely never design in Niger. It's 45 degrees outside. Um, you were not going to have a cafe, cafe tables you know, outside to enjoy the sunshine. We actually do the exact opposite thing where we're trying to run away from the sunshine. So then what do you do, actually? If you cannot apply those things, then how do you start creating spaces? 
And so as a result, you know, the feeling, the feeling I got when I returned was that our stories were really all mixed up. You know, I didn't know whether I was coming or going. It was just really very confusing, particularly because, you know, we often face dilemmas. And I think, you know, most architects, certainly the ones practicing in Africa, face this, this dilemma around modernity and how to actually make modernity and modern architecture and its demands. And unfortunately, you know, I think too often also our tendency has been um, one of mimicking solutions um, that are elsewhere. Um, but unfortunately, obviously, as, as I pointed out earlier, those solutions are often agnostic of our realities. Um, and they're based on stories that are really not, you know, of the place where we're trying to transplant them in. So when we think about, you know, the kind of materials that we use, you know, and the shapes that we actually make, you know, in architecture, if we make a, when we make a single family home that is nice and contained and condensed um, and kind of in the style that you would find in Europe, for example, in a city like Niamey in Niger, what we're doing is creating a, a form who's one of, one, of, one of the objective of which is to retain heat because it comes from a colder climate, right? And so then all of a sudden you just have to question all of these things and start you know, um, really looking through them and looking through um, the lens of the local stories. And so in the office, this has become a central um, concern of ours, obviously, and uh, which has made us essentially constantly reading the story around us the context, the narrative, the motivations, especially the motivations um, of who is doing what and who is building in order to address the challenges on the ground. Um, a recurrent story in our work um, has been the economic weight of architecture. And it's directly related to, again, the kind of copying of um, models from elsewhere because those models tend to be fairly expensive, especially considering um, our economic situation. And it often results in things like these, where we have um, cities that are modeled, modeled a certain way, um, that require a certain way of functioning. Let's say for commerce, you know, normally if you have a Western style city, all of your shops are just so in a row, you know, and things like that um, along the street and play nice with the sidewalk and things of that nature. Um, and in many African cities, you see something that looks more like this for the simple reason that actually it's way too expensive to have your shop just perfectly, you know, on the street edge, just so, who has that kind of money. And so it creates this architecture of, of informality, which to me is just really code for, you don't look right. You know, this is not the way this is supposed to look. That's really all it means. But really, it's more of a tactic of survival. You know, these people are just trying to use an infrastructure, the street, which is kind of this freely available space, to be able to have some kind of economic project, you know, some kind of way of survival. And I've come to view this um, not, not as a source of shame or of inadequacy, but really as a source of inspiration, particularly when we're thinking about urban projects. Because in there, there's, there's just this resourcefulness that uses what is there and just tries to make something, you know, out of it. And Niamey specifically is a city where the streets are the primary public space and the primarily kind of common space um, used for commerce, as I showed earlier, um, but also used for live events like weddings and things of that nature. Um, they're also heavily used for socializing, particularly for men. And this is something that we've been really interested in looking at at the bottom right corner um, these men um, sitting in front of the compound of their house, um, which is this phenomenon called fada. And a fada is essentially a place where you have young men from a neighborhood just congregating and they can stay there and, you know, play cards and, you know, drink tea until the wee hours in the morning. But no woman can be there, right? It would be an egregious mistake, you know, and it would cause um, the young woman's reputation to immediately disintegrate. And so it got us... It led us to a project where, you know, I was thinking about what is social space, public space, in a city like Niamey, which is a Muslim city, um, where actually the presence of women in the street for purposes other than, you know, running errands or going to school or going to work or conducting, you know, um, market business or something like that is frowned upon, essentially. You know, what is it that you do to navigate a space where um, your presence sometimes can be considered suspect? And I started, wonder, I started, I started thinking back um, in my teenagehood, a long time ago, um, 
wondering, you know, do we have such a thing as a fada? Did we have, you know, kind of this, this public space where we could actually be outside? And I realized that we actually had this very um, subversive way of achieving the same thing, where we would go to each other's homes um, and then walk each other back and forth from our houses, which ended up being kind of this constant walking back and forth and back and forth and spending like two hours in the neighborhood just walking endlessly, which was really just staying static. But because we were walking, no one was wondering what we were doing out there or where we were going because it just seemed like we were on our way somewhere. So there was nothing to worry about. But essentially, that was our private space, safe space and public space. And so I went back to Niamey and had um, a series of workshops and discussions with young women trying to figure out, well, what is it, you know, is this story still accurate? Is this still happening? Is this still how they navigate, you know, the streets and public space? And the answer was a resounding yes. Um, and, but most importantly, what, they've, what, what came out of these discussions was really this yearning for really being part of the city, for really being able to experience the everyday you know, hustle and bustle and everything that's going on as you're walking down the street, even if you cannot sit and watch it go by, but at least you know, going on walks. And they were going on these walks ritualistically, even in a, in a stronger way than we were when we were their age. And so we talked about the public, the public spaces they tend to go to um, in the city, which were um, the National Museum and um, the National Stadium because they were really, really into sports. And so throughout the conversations, you know, the whole thing took shape as this project, this proposition that would be essentially an itinerary that would link these two spaces, you know, that would allow them to go from one to the other on foot that would come close to a lot of the schools so that it would be an itinerary that could basically just kind of suck someone in, you know, as they come out of school on their way home or something like that. Um, that would, because Niamey is kind of split in two, when you have one side that is very affluent, the other one that's not very affluent, that would kind of go through the least affluent um, parts of the city, which also tend to be more religiously conservative, that would um, come close to more green spaces. I'm so sorry, these slides are really washed out. I should have paid more attention to that. It's difficult to see. Um, the basically shaded gray areas are these green spaces and these valleys that we have running through the city and avoiding any kind of um, dangerous areas, um, of known dangerous areas of the city or areas that had a lot of um, activity, um, commercial activities specifically in terms of really, really... Um, big markets and things like that so that they would have some privacy in, in these walks. And it ended up being kind of this proposition that was this four mile long um, promenade throughout the city where they could do different things. Um, you know, they could play sports, you know, they could walk over to play sports, um, watch something happening, you know, study um, down at the, um, at the library, stroll through the museum, you know, um, and walk through the neighborhood in general. And so in order to make these walks even more of a um, kind of, um, or this itinerary even more of a draw, um, the proposition was to put all this a bunch of program along the road and program that would be actually useful to them and that they do on a daily basis, like studying, which they tend to just go to school to do, rather than that, starting to imagine spaces along the route, on the street, where that would be architected um, to study, or, you know, or for fitness spaces or markets, and kind of you know, organizing them in a way that um, was mindful of the gender, but also allow a certain mixing that, would, that wouldn't be uncomfortable. And so in the, in the end, it ended up being a project that was something akin to a cultural center, really, but exploded over four miles, which was kind of this you know, new way of looking at, instead of having a building, how about having a serious, you know, a chunk of buildings or pavilions, or I mean, not pavilions, but a chunk, chunks of program throughout the city that actually all go towards one um, central um, project. And the architecture then was to be um, inspired from the architecture of the economic informality that we're seeing in the streets in terms of you know, use of recycled metal, for example. That's actually the main um, used material. Um, plastic jugs, mats, earthen bricks, you name it. Just very affordable um, 
solutions in the very same way that a lot of the architecture or industry along um, the walls of compounds is currently being built um, by people using it for commerce. And then also obviously trying to figure out how to create spaces that have a certain level of privacy um, that allow you to be in the open but still you know, has th thresholds that separate you from the hustle and bustle that is around you. So then we started imagining things like these, where it would be, you know, these shaded spaces or amphitheaters where people could work out or have, you know, classes um, or, you know, where people could have female-centered community initiatives, which is something that happens a lot, where they'll have, you know, little meetings or they'll have things where they will teach young girls, you know, about their health or about, you know, different things. But they do that either, either at someone else's house or... Um, in school often. So really taking those, those programs out that they already use and put them along the route. Like I said, like markets. But really just very strongly saying that um, there's really nothing wrong with this infrastructure that you know, grafts itself on these walls, you know, just because that's not what the walls were supposed to be meant for. Um, th these were kind of um, some imaginings of what um, study spaces could look like, you know, built up against the wall, you know, of, um, of someone's house, for example. And in the end, this project was really about um, embracing something um, about the city, about how the city currently works, and about, um, and instead of find it, fighting it, actually looking at it as clues for a new typology, really, that could be used for other things, you know, not just commerce, but that could be used for actually really doing architecture and urban design in a completely different way for that specific place, because that's what, you know, is affordable and it's doable in that particular way. But recently, we got to tackle a different kind of story. Um, and this story is about a village in Niger, um, which on which doesn't really have a marketplace. It has a market that is weekly, which is the case in many villages in, in Niger. And I should pref preface this by saying that actually, um, Niger is a very rural country. 75% of the population lives in a village. And so this was a very interesting story for us because we, it made us realize that having a market that only opens once a week and then everybody vanishes, means that actually you have an entire village where maybe there are 3,000 people and there's no local economy. Because everybody really lives off of whatever they cultivate in the fields during the rainy season, which lasts three months. They harvest, they sell, they keep to eat, and that's it. And that's how it's been. Unfortunately, the world has changed. We're on a global stage with a global economy, and commerce has become important in, in, in order to make a livelihood. And because, again, Niger is an arid country, a lot of these places are subjected to very serious droughts, which have caused people to lose everything, their cattle, their fields, and massively migrating to um, the cities nearby. And so this story was very interesting for us because you know, we got on the site for the very first time and it was empty, right? Like it's not used um, because it was not market day. But we thought it was very interesting that they had this permanent infrastructure that was there, but it only to be used temporarily. And so we were approached to create a new market for this area, and the villagers had in mind that this would be a permanent daily market for the first time. Because we had these conversations where all of us kind of recognized that, okay, yes, it would be really useful, actually, to provide a place where different people in the village can now decide to start selling, you know, whatever they make, you know, products that they would transform, um, their, not just their crops, things that they would procure from elsewhere, you know, from vendors, you know, whatever. And so the current village, um, the, the market uh, was organized around this tree, which they specifically told us that it's basically one of the most important trees in the village. It's been there, some, some people were saying 100 years, some people were saying you know, 50, I don't know. But in any case, the conclusion was that it was super important. And so we decided to keep the, the new market in the same spot um, and to organize the whole thing around the tree and inspiring ourselves from the existing architecture to create something that would not only you know, amplify and elevate um, 
what they're already doing in the market that would still be familiar because um, the shape of them, you know, be because the materials we were using were very familiar. We were using compressed earth bricks um, to make them, which were very similar in, in hue um, and, and in color, or, I mean, in, in hue and in uh, properties to the adobe bricks they were using um, in the market previously. And it was just a very simple proposition of just having these very rational boxes that you know provide everything that they can possibly need from uh, parking for their bikes to a bench to sit to a place to sell to you know like a little boutique to either store or um, or display their goods. But most importantly, obviously, we had to deal with the heat, um, and so we played around with these structures um, that provided heat because we could not afford to plant trees and watch them grow 10 years later. Um, that's not going to shade anyone. And so we devised these, um, these metal discs um, that would actually heat up and suck up the heat that was at the bottom to make it cooler and allow for better ventilation um, to make the marketplace much more comfortable. And so ultimately the idea was to design a market that could foster a sense of pride in the place um, that would also attract and make it desirable for people to stay there and sell there and want to be there every day. That was really important because the proposition was that we were going to change something that had been that way for maybe a century, these weekly markets. And now all of a sudden, people had to change their minds and want to be there every day. So it was very important for us that it was also aesthetically very desirable from that point of view. And while the project was very exciting um, to people in Niger, definitely in, in, the, in the village, they were very happy, um, I was really interested by something that happened afterwards. Um, outside of Niger, I received a couple of questions. Somebody asked, asked um, why did you not plant real trees instead of these metal structures? Um, and someone else was saying, you know, why did you not make the metal structure more useful by adding, say, solar panels on top of them? And I absolutely loved th these questions because I thought they were also very revealing of, again, the inherent biases that we have in the stories of architecture that we tell and that we teach in that we think of sustainability um, as greenery. You know, you plant trees, that's the sustainable thing to do. You put solar panels on, that's the sustainable thing to do. But this is a place that tree where trees cannot really grow. So actually planting trees would be incredibly water-consuming, intensive, in a place that cannot afford to actually do away with the water as much. So which is the most sustainable approach? I don't know. Um, and the solar panels, really, the village doesn't, I mean, the, the market doesn't use any electricity. So the solar panels wouldn't necessarily be immediately useful unless it becomes a night market. But most importantly, it would be unbelievably expensive. It would add so much to the bottom line of the built project and the village just did not have that kind of budget. So it was really interesting for me to reflect back and see once again, you know, how someone else's story, you know, is always, always kind of becomes this point of confusion that makes it more difficult, I think, when we're thinking about, when we're making architecture in places such as these, to make the right decision and to say, well, actually, this is, this is what would work here and this, this is more sustainable than another, especially when things start becoming a bit dogmatic in terms of what is it that makes sense and what is it that you should do and what is architecture, you know, at the end of the day. And earlier than that, a project that combined many narratives and many stories um, in Niger was this housing project that we did called Niami 2000. Um, I developed it as part of this collective called United for Design, um, which includes people from all over. We had a German person, Philip Schreiter, um, Elizabeth Golden, who's American, um, Yasmin Ismaili, who's from Iran. And we embarked on this project um, to do this housing project in in Niger, um, that was going to look at issues of density, um, issues of affordability, more specifically, but also of um, cultural appropriateness. And it came up because um, Niamey is a city that has been growing exponentially, and part of the reason being the droughts that I was talking about that has been actually 
bringing a lot of people in um, and making the, the city grow kind of widely. But it's a city that has been growing, you know, kind of flat. If you see this image, you know, everything is pretty much one story. So there's no density whatsoever. And the infrastructure, um, the reality is that the infrastructure of the city has not been able to follow. It has not been able to, um, to really be access to, to water, for example, is a problem. Access to electricity is a problem because the infrastructure is stretched way too thin. And so we started thinking about, well, how do we take your average plot and try to see how to densify it to a maximum, but without necessarily having to create um, an apartment building, which in a place like Niamey, which just has maybe two million people, is highly unnecessary to, get to, that, to go to that step from the beginning. And so it ended up being this exercise of you know, figuring out how to densify, how to go up in height, protect privacy, because we're a very private society where you don't necessarily, you will never see big windows that allow you to see inside someone else's house um, or be able to see any, any part of a, a person's house, um, frankly, which is why we actually put everything behind a compound wall. And so it was how do we take, let's say um, this is a 2,000 square meter um, plot, which normally, because we have a lot of space, people would build about four houses. If you see um, over here, this is one house. This is one house, and then there's one house, there's one house. So this, so this is the space for four houses, really. And the, the challenge was how, how much can we pack and still have your three-bedroom, three-bathroom, you know, and all of those things, have a proper, you know, home um, for a, mid, a, a mid-income um, family. And the answer in this particular case was 10. And so um, for, the, for the, uh, the people who invested in the project, it was a great proposition because then all of a sudden they could densify and really make their money work for them. And essentially, um, we, we did it just slightly over the price of those four homes. And so, well, actually, just wanted to show a little bit of the interlocking of the different spaces and the open spaces of the, um, of the project. And the a main concern around the project was how to keep temperatures down again. This is a constant obsession that we have um, because of the 45 degree heat thing. Um, and so we set up a lot of you know, natural ventilation, stack ventilation, but most importantly also used um, compressed earth bricks, which have the thermal qualities of adobe bricks um, to help to keep the, the temperatures down. This is cru crucial. Not, not only because it makes the houses more affordable, they're about 30% cheaper than um, your cement and block homes, but also because the amount of money that people spend in electricity bill can be staggering. When you have, at the hottest times of the year where it can reach up to 50 degrees, some people's electricity bill is up to one third of their salary. So obviously this is something to worry about, that is part of the story of this place that then the story of our architecture has to tackle. And so the result was, you know, these sets of homes, you know, with different spaces um, for congregation also, we were thinking about how is it that culturally we use a house? How do we, you know, how do we entertain? How do we hang out with our friends? You know, how do we eat? How, you know, where do we sleep? And how much privacy do we need? And the project really only concerned itself with those considerations, aside from the purely you know, economic and um, climatic considerations, to create a series of you know, spaces at different degrees of intimacy um, for you know, cooling, being together, and just essentially being able to live comfortably, honestly, in the way you culturally prefer without having to confine yourself to, you know, like bedroom, living room, dining room, all, everything next to each other, because that's what you saw on the internet somewhere. That's often what happens. <laughs> um, we've been really lucky to be able to tackle some projects um, that tell very complex stories and that we've had to detangle just a massive amount of you know, landmines in a way, and that span the social, cultural, even political um, aspects. And this particular project um, came by way of this building, um, which 
we were trying to save. So this is a mosque um, in a village of Niger uh, built by a master mason called Al-Hajj Barmufalki. And I say his name because uh, what I knew about this mosque was that um, this man won the Aga Khan Prize for Architecture in 1986 for a similar mosque uh, one, one hour away. And nobody in Niger knew about this. But the village basically wanted to destroy this mosque and build a replica in cement out of it because cement and concrete is, is durable ver versus adobe, which is, cons which is um, looked at as not being durable. The mosque had fallen into disrepair and they needed a bigger one and they needed one that didn't require any kind of maintenance, you know, as, at least as, as they saw it. Um, so we made this, this argument that, well, actually, this is a national treasure <laughs> in this mosque. And um, it had inside of it, you know, a massive amount of things to teach in terms of architectural techniques, actually. And um, we had a bunch of conversations with different people from the village, you know, with women groups, with students, you know, with village leaders, trying to figure out, you know, what to do. First, trying to impart the importance of this particular building. Um, and making the case for not destroying it. And then the conversation ended up being, well, okay, well, if we don't destroy it, it's too, it's too little because the village is much too big now. We still need a new mosque. What do we do with it? And I, to this day, I still have a hard time remembering how this came up, but the idea of turning it into a library kind of was floated around. And the minute I heard that word, I just pounced on it. And we we're like, yes, this is what we should do. And it was particularly pertinent um, for this particular place because um, it's a very young population. Um, when you go there, actually, you just see children everywhere. You see a few, few adults and just children everywhere. That's just the massive amount of young people um, with a very low literacy rate, particularly for women, and an unbelievably low success rate at exams. So actually the importance of the library became even more heightened in the sense that we were able to recognize because we had workshops with the students where we would make them write things down, you know, have small essays and tell us when, what they want to do with, what they, when they grow up, what their aspirations are, what they do on a daily basis. And we realized that, you know, the language mastery and the reading, the, the reading and writing fluency was very problematic. And so the library was definitely going to be something that would help fight that and really elevate the level from that point of view. And so the, the project turned into this complex, really, uh, where we had the old mosque. Um, the old mosque over here turned into a library with a new mosque ne next to it and, uh, and, and a garden in between that would link the two. And... The new library then now is sitting across from the old mosque, and essentially we, were, we had been commissioned to build two different projects. We were supposed to have a library on one side, you know, have a wall, have a street, and then have the mosque on the other. But we saw this opportunity to actually, um, and by the way, I, I, I did this project as a collaboration with um, my Iranian friend, Yasmin Ismaili, as well, because both of us coming from Muslim backgrounds, we thought this was actually a really interesting thing to tackle. And um, it was really interesting for us to actually devise it as a complex and devise it as a place that is together, where you have this mosque, this place of worship that has to coexist with this place of secular knowledge, which if you know a little bit about what's happening right now in, in parts of West Africa, particularly in northern Nigeria, for example, with Boko Haram, that's actually the crux of the issue. This idea that secular knowledge somehow is anti-religious, is anti-Islamic, you know, or something like that, which is the furthest from the truth. And uh, it allowed us to actually have these really engaging conversations with the villagers because we found out that this model where you have a library or research center and a mosque is actually one of the earliest models of how mosques were done, you know, in places like Baghdad, for example, at the very start of Islam. And have the conversations around the fact that actually in Islam, the pursuit of knowledge is a sacred duty of any Muslim. And there is a, the, even scriptures that specifically say that you have to be willing to go as far away as Asia, back then that was the furthest you can possibly imagine, in order to acquire knowledge, you know, whatever it is. So it really allowed a lot of fruitful conversations to happen in that way. And to really make this, this for us, it was actually a return back 
to what this religion was always about. And then it was really important to make the relationship between the two benign, that there's no opposition. And so we created these paths in between, in between to ensure that when people are going um, from one side to the other, when they're, going, when they're studying in, school, in class, because you have to pray five times a, a day, so that's really convenient, at, at some point it will be time for prayer. So at some point you walk down one of those paths, go to the mosque, and then walk back. And that back and forth is really all we need in order to make these two um, elements co cohabitate, you know, or coexist. And we were very interested in keeping the old structure, as I said, and preserving the building as is. And we were lucky to be able to find, you know, this was the second in command um, of the, 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 the mason that I told you about, who since then has passed away. And they came back and rebuilt in, um, the old mosque, which had all but melted away to its previous glory. And we provided improvements you know, on the facades because one of the main, main issues um, they were talking about was the fact that it was really difficult to maintain an adobe building. You, know, you have to replaster it every year and no one really has time to do that anymore. It used to be that it was a ritual in villages where every year everybody would go around and they would replaster the homes, they would replaster you know, the, the, the village um, buildings and all that, but that doesn't happen anymore. And so while we kept the, the, the structure as is, what we did in terms of plaster is you know, introduce additives in the plaster that will allow them to not have to be maintained for 10 years, for 15 years at a time. And the building will stay pristine and in its, and in its shape. But we also learned a lot um, through the project. Um, we, we learned, we, we collaborated with, um, with masons um, who knew how to do dome bricks without formwork, which was <laughs> actually a big deal. <laughs> um, this project almost didn't happen, just a little story around it. Um, I basically had a nervous breakdown <laughs> during this project because we were supposed to make these domes and we arrived on site, which is seven hours away from the capital. So we drove over and we arrived and they had made these formworks and there were two domes built and they were the most misshapen, mangled things you had ever seen. And we were just thinking, well, okay, I guess now the project is dead because there's really nothing more important than these domes in this particular structure. And then we had um, a mason um, who was in this team working on, um, on the replastering and the resurfacing of the old mosque who was just watching us. Obviously, he knew something because he was very condescending about it. He was kind of like, hmm. So I called him over. At that, at that point, I was on the floor, like just thinking this is the end. And I asked him, I was like, do you know, do you know how to make these domes? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, but no, but seriously, <laughs> do you, like, how do you do it? And I was like, oh, do you want me to do it or what? <laughs> just, <laughs> just tell me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, how about you try it? You know, and we had these, these um, concrete beams um, that we built, and they just, you know, jumped on top of them um, and had just a thread, the magic thread thing that masons use. I don't know how it works. Um, and they made these perfectly composed and shaped domes you have ever seen. And they were doing that by hand, one brick at a time, one brick at a time, although by hand, without a single thing. I've never seen anything like it. It was unbelievable. And um, ultimately, um, we made the entire project, because of the materials that we use, because of the, the different approaches, um, the, all the money that was earmarked for making the new, a new mosque you know, out of concrete, we were able to make the entire complex, you know, the renovation, the new mosque, including classrooms you know, and the garden and things like that, for actually less than that, less of the total amount. And what that said to me, um, it reinforced in me the belief, yeah, that, right? <laughs> That's what they did. They're so good. Um, it reinforced in me um, the belief that our tendency, you know, to draw from these kind of disconnected, you know, resources, disconnected images um, of our reality is really unfortunate in the sense that it makes us miss, you know, just the genius that we could really draw on. And these stories um, really ignored the fact um, that for, 
in the first place, the things we're trying to copy, you know, have a very big capital investment um, attached to them, right? And we conveniently also forget that one of the reasons why things look the way they do, you know, whether in Europe or America or whatever, it's because at some, at some point they had access to free capital, which we don't. They had access to free labor, they had access to free resources, which we don't. So how can we mimic the same thing? It's never going to happen, or at least we shouldn't try it, I don't think, I hope. Um, and so taking the time to learn these local stories ha has been really, you know, really eye-opening because of the savings we were able to do, really kind of proving to ourselves that um, this project could, I mean, projects such as these can be taken in a direction where you can be, you don't have to apologize for the way, for things looking local or for things looking like, you know, they belong there and somehow thinking that, well, this is not modern, or this is not, you know, to me, this is as modern as anything else. I don't see a difference between this building and, you know, a Gothic cathedral or something like that, that no one is going to look down on ever if a church is turned into a library, which I think there's a project like that, actually. Um, everybody sees the beauty in that. So why can't we see the beauty in this? This is the exact same thing. And so the most important aspect um, has been for us that, we were able to build on an existing local narrative, but most importantly, set up the stage for a new story and for a kind of change of trajectory almost in where the story was going in terms of religion, in terms of you know, the place of women and of young people in a place such as this. Before this project, um, women never went to the mosque. There was really no comfortable space for them to be in. And the project essentially not only you know, has the library and literacy classes um, for adults where both, that both men and women um, go to, but the mosque also is a place now where a lot of women are um, often going to. And for us, that was unbelievably encouraging um, in sort of the, um, um, the agency that we can have as architects in shaping stories that are existing on the ground and moving them forward. And occasionally, we even tackle commercial projects like this office building, you know, for a tech incubator in Yemen. But here, too, the story is about, is rooted in the local reality and the economic reality and the staggering cost of construction and energy costs, as I mentioned before, um, how expensive um, electricity is in Niger. And so the scheme addresses that in every possible way. From the material, this will be the very first building that uses raw, unfired bricks um, on five levels. Um, solar protection mechanisms, natural ventilation mechanisms, renewable energy. This is the project that uses solar panels. <laughs> and so ultimately, I think as a continent, um, what all the work has been teaching me so far is that we have this amazing opportunity to not only, you know, um, leapfrog, really, and avoid a lot of pitfalls that we've seen, kind of how, you know, anything that has failed elsewhere. Um, but also we have this opportunity of being a source of inspiration because we get to tackle challenges right now, immediately, because a lot of things haven't been set in stone yet um, that have to do with climate change, that have to do with urban growth, that have to do with economic vulnerability. And that's something that the whole world could learn from. And so I think... It's a very exciting time, particularly, I think a lot of you, you know, if a lot of you are students, you know, as future architects, um, it's a very exciting time for me um, with all of these, this growth and all of these challenges. And the question really is whether, you know, we will continue or ha develop a story um, as Af in, you know, in the African context, you know, or elsewhere, where we consider that we have nothing to offer and that all the answers have to come from elsewhere or if we're going to actually make new stories that move things forward um, and that can make something new and exciting. Thank you for listening.